What is up everybody, Golden Yogi here, and you are tuning into the channel with The Golden Perspective. Today, I have something new. I'm going to be reading Arthur Hayes' most recent article, Contagion. I really like him as an author. I think he really discovers some points that I don't see talked about often. So, I thought, you know, way to get this knowledge out there more that I would just read it to you and we can open up dialogue all right before I get started I want to kindly invite you to subscribe down below if you have not already while you're down there turn on the post notification so you know when the next video is coming up like comment share with a friend let me know what you think go down to the description as well and look at all the different links that I have available and yeah Follow me over on library, great place as well, and let's get started. This article is titled Contagion, and I'll just go ahead. Any views expressed in this below are the personal views of the author and should not form the basis for making investment decisions, nor be construed as a recommendation or advice to engage in investment transactions. Now, I always love that he's always got a new rare Pepe card. Uh, For better or for worse, one of the interesting upshots of the pandemic and ensuing outpour of pseudoscience on social media is that we are all now steeped in epidemiology. Remember, flattening the curve, social distancing, lockdowns, etc. I bet some of you can even recall RO, or not, or the number of healthy humans on average COVID infected human infects. The comrades in Greater China are still living this nightmare, but thankfully the rest of the world has largely moved on. Politicians have refocused their talent for misdirection on getting their constituents invested in the war for Russia reunification, or of Russian aggression, depending on which side of the Iron Curtain you reside. Humanity now fights a two-front war, a war against an invisible virus. I know your commander-in-chief might have told you COVID is over, but viruses don't adhere to election cycles and their economic impacts linger long after the last rapid test clinic has shuttered. And an undeclared world war between US, NATO and Eurasia, Russia, China. The current policies of the fiscal and monetary authorities are driven by their attempts to mitigate the economic effects of these two conflicts. Given that all politicians, elect or not, are focused on short-term myopic policies, they typically default to printing money to solve nearly all issues. There are, very few, there are very few problems that an infusion of cash can't fix, which often makes printing money the easiest and quickest solution. It can be done immediately, without much discussion or deliberation. The alternative, long-term restructuring of our global economy, would entail immense pain for certain stakeholders and would necessitate having an honest conversation about the true state of our civilization. Both of those requirements are non-starters for our short-sighted political friends. So regardless of whether your government practices capitalism, communism, social socialism, or fascism, they all inevitably turn to printing moneyism, the paper over any and all problems. As we know, when you stimulate demand with free money, people buy stuff. When you buy too much, let's rewrite that. I want to read. As we know, when you stimulate demand for free money, people buy shit. When people buy too much shit, the price goes up. That's called inflation. Every country in the world is experiencing some sort of goods, food, or energy inflation. When the latter two subsets of inflation increase rapidly, the once docile plebs wake up and demand action. They will express it either at the ballot box or in the streets, but regardless, they will be heard. What will you be doing in order to feed your crying hungry child? The world's, the world's major central banks, the Federal Reserve, Fed, the People's Bank of China, the PBOC, the Bank of Japan, BOJ, the European Central Bank, ECG, ECB, and the Bank of England, BOE, all assisted their governments by printing money in some way, shape, or form during the pandemic. They all worried about the ensuing inflation and have since pledged with words and occasionally followed up with actions to remove fiat liquidity and tighten monetary conditions. Imagine taking a roundhouse kick to the face courtesy of Nate Diaz. That's probably about how the financial markets felt when the US's and select handful of others fiat wampum was withdrawn. The worst hit markets were sovereign debt markets with a bond market route that has been nearly the worst in recorded human financial history. <clears throat> 
At the same time, the undeclared World War III is intensifying, headlined by recent attacks on critical gas pipelines C, Nordstrom 1 and 2. The situation is putting a strain on the global economy as it is, and the compounding effects financial uh, and the compounding financial effects of a withdrawn withdrawal of credit from the system are evident. The major central banks have begun to backslide on their promises to fight inflation and the next pandemic, the yield curve control (YCC) virus is quickly spreading. Over a long time, uh, over a long enough time horizon, all central banks will succumb. Here's a quick scorecard of where each one is at currently. The Bank of England recently reverted to quantitative easing QE in order to save its financial system, which will soon morph into YCC, more on this later. Bank of Japan, continuing their policy of YCC in order to save their banking system and allow the government to borrow at affordable rates. The ECB, the European Central Bank, continuing to print money to purchase the bonds of weak members of the EU but has pledged to begin quantitative tightening very soon. More on this later as well. The People's Bank of China restarting the money printer in order to provide liquidity to the banking system to prop up falling residential property markets. The Fed continuing, continuing to raise interest rates and is shrinking its balance sheet via QT, quantitative tightening. <coughs> 80% of most globally important central banks, because there's five right there we just listed, are engaged in some form of money printing. Only the Fed has stood resolute in the face of financial market bloodbath determined to see through its hopeless quest to quell the inflation for which it has least partially, it is at least partially responsible for. A culmination of decades worth of terrible economic policies with a world war cherry on top. <coughs> <coughs> Of all the types of money printing, the most disastrous for the value of fiat currency and by extension society is yield curve control. That is because it inherently requires central banks to attempt to fix the price of a multi-trillion dollar bond market. Central banks that engage in YCC are essentially pledging to infinitely expand, expand their balance sheets such that a particular interest rate metric does not rise above an unnatural ceiling set by the central bank. <coughs> the market always wins, and the market wins by inflicting crushing inflation on the entirety of humanity, human civilization. The Bank of Japan's yield curve control policy is the longest standing. The Bank of England effectively just joined them and the thesis of my essay this week is that the European Central Bank is not far behind. A move by the European Central Bank towards YCC would mean that the majority, 60% of the major central banks would be engaged in this terrible policy. I could even argue that the number would actually be 80% since the PBOC, People's Bank of China, works within the Chinese financial system. The Chinese regularly target a certain amount of economic activity and will supply any amount of credit necessary to hit the number. Side note, technically speaking, the Bank of England committed to a time-bound uh, Great British Pound 65 billion bond price-fixing operation that they have said will only span for the next 13 weeks. But I suspect that won't last uh, as we see the Bank of England's YCC. Once you admit defeat in the face of markets, you are on the hook indefinitely. Now that the Bank of England has broadcasted that it will be required to buy your guilt at inflated prices, why the fuck would you not sell them every single guilt you have? Market participants taking advantage of this policy will only push the bank further into the hole it dug itself. So I think it's safe to assume that the BOE will be re-upping uh, this program and as such, I will count them as being in the YCC camp. The Bank of England's sudden reversal going from a bank determined to st slay inflation via raising interest rates and QT to buying an unlimited amount of UK, UK guild in just a few trading days serves as good blueprint for how I expect the ECB will be dragged kicking and screaming to implementing a similar policy. Spoiler alert. This is all building up to Big Daddy Fed eventually succumbing to the YCC virus and joining its compatriots in the land of the living dead. Down on Threadneedle Street in London, a quick aside before we jump into the BOE's recent foibles, someone in a chat room I was recently referred to, uh, 
referred to the British royal family as the Kardashians with crowns, and it made me chuckle. The amount of attention the royal family garners is sad to me. Maybe UK politicians wouldn't have been so uh, been able to get away with the energy and economic fairy tales if their populace was engaged with the policies as they are now, as they are how poorly not with the Queen. Sorry, let me rephrase that. Maybe UK politicians wouldn't have been able to get away with the energy and economic fairy tales if their populace was as engaged with their policies as they are with how poorly or not the late Queen treated Meghan, Duchess of Sussex. Getting back on track, in response to COVID, the Bank of England did what all good central banks do when presented with a crisis. They printed that money. To give you a bit of historical perspective, here's a chart showing the Bank of England's total assets as a percentage of GDP since its founding in the 18th century. So this goes back to like early 1700, all the way up to now. The UK has been through some shit over the last three centuries, pandemics, wars of empires, civil wars, world wars, etc. But even taking all that into account, you can see that the BOE's recent bout of money printing was its most aggressive ever. That's crazy. Bank of England's total assets as percent of GDP in white versus the UK Consumer Price Index in yellow. Back to the now, here's how inflation responded with a bit of a lag to what has been the most aggressive monetary loosening in the bank's history. King Charles only wishes that the gold line above was charting his popularity. But no, it's just a representation of the suffering of his subjects. The Bank of England recognized earlier that its peers, sorry, the Bank of England recognized earlier than its peers that something had to be done about the runway inflation, runaway inflation, its money printing ignited. The bank even forecasted in its August 2022 report that inflation would rise to a high of over 13% by year end before aggressively tapering in 2023 and 24. In, attempt, in an attempt to ameliorate, I can't say that word right now. In an attempt to ameliorate the situation, the Bank of England was first was the first major central bank to begin reducing its balance sheet and raising its policy rate, which would be like the interest rate. The Bank of England's first rate hike was in December of 2021. Remember that back then, Jay Powell and wasn't even thinking about thinking about raising rates. He didn't even join his pals on Threadneedle Street at the party until March of 2022. UK policymakers, like most of their brethren in the developed world, believe in energy fairy tales, namely that the developed world, which has basically grew up in lockstep with the use of hydrocarbons, could, by a year that ends in a zero year, 2050, eschew those hydrocarbons completely for the less energy-dense wind and solar. The UK has coal, oil and in the North Sea, and possibly trapped shale oil as well. But these sources of energy independence have been shunted aside, and the UK's energy import bill has gotten larger and larger. as you can see by these charts. World War III is currently an economic war that is causing the energy markets to balkanize, split up in different ways, which has and will continue to be highly inflationary. A country that has both pursued the most aggressive money printing in its history and must import energy simply will not be able to escape the jaws of inflation. Look at those petrol prices and energy bills going up, up, up. The chart above clearly shows that energy inflation is a big contributor to the overall pain felt by the plebs. The UK is being hit by a double whammy. Not only must the Bank of England remove credit from the system to reduce demand, but energy prices must rise as well due to the inflationary aspects of World War III. This is not a recipe for economic growth. Boris Johnson finally got his uh, comeuppance, and it wasn't due to his bumping and grinding during lockdown at 10 Downing Street. He was ultimately KO'd by the poor economic performance of his country. In came Prime Minister, Prime Minister Truss and her merry band of fools, ready to deploy the tried and true medicine of any government. Goodies for everyone. Look under your seat, everyone. You win something, you get something. Last week, she unveiled a new budget replete with measures that will definitely stimulate the economy. For the rich, she reduced the corporate and individual tax rates. For the poor, she intends to hand out vouchers to pay for increased energy bills. 
Hip hip hooray! It's Margaret Thatcher with a new pantsuit. To paraphrase my homie Jim Bianco, the problem with trust budget, the problem with trust's budget is that it'll work. By work, he means that it will spur activity at a time when inflation is raging at greater than 10%. The bond market would have strongly preferred for trust to have committed to raising taxes and cutting government spending, aka austerity, but both were absent from trust's budget, so the bond market threw a fit. This is a chart of the 30-year guild yield. So guilds are bonds in the UK. As you can see in the days after Truss announced her budget, yield spikes, yields spiked the most they have in history. And remember, the guild market is the longest continued bond market in the world. So we're talking about a few hundred years of history now. Biggest swing over a few hundred years of history. Just like that chart way up here. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Right there. Giant amount of money printing by the Bank of England. Suffice to say, the guild market put on some Cardi B and showed the poll who's boss. Look at that right over there. The very far right, just going from 0.5 all the way down to negative 1. Never like that scene since, like, in this range of... Wow. Before this happened, the Bank of England was supposedly super duper committed to fighting inflation. To their credit, they were actually raising short-term rates and reducing the size of their balance sheet. But the rapid rise in yields threatened to destroy the entire highly leveraged UK financial system overnight, forcing them to change course. I won't go into too much detail, but the systematic threat to the UK banking system stemmed from accounting gimmicks that the regulators allowed pension funds to participate in. Essentially, the UK pension funds were allowed to use levered derivatives in the interest rate markets to match their liabilities. Derivatives require margin, and when you are short rates and rates rise, then you must post more margin. The pension funds didn't have the money. They spent it all on trying to pick stocks and whatever else their sell-side bankers could stuff with them and the historic uh, rate spike would have caused them to go bankrupt overnight, thus causing thousands and thousands of people's pensions to just die. The FT has an excellent description of the chicanery that occurred under the watchful eye of the BOE. So to avoid a financial apocalypse, the BOE in a single morning abandoned all their hard work and moved immediately to unlimited purchases of long dated guilds in order to jam prices lower. This is another lesson in never shall I ever fight a central bank. The above chart is of the current on the sorry, the above chart is of the current on the run 30 year guild. On September 28th, after BOE turned the money printer back on, this bond market moved 30%. 30 fucking percent. That is unheard of in of a daily move for a developed market sovereign bond. You might think you were invested in an offshore USD bond of Chinese property developer, but no, it's just His Majesty's, His Majesty's government obligations. The political need to hand out goodies to the population to help them fight the terrible current economic situation ran headfirst into financial reality. Given that, like all modern economies, the UK financial system is debt-based and highly levered, the central bank did what it's supposed to do, protect the financial system from an asset price deflation. Remember this, as bad as it is right now, inflation is not their number one priority. The Bank of England, for example, couldn't have made that clearer. In a few hours, they threw almost a year of prudent monetary policy out the window to save the financial system. And in the process, they ushered in the end game, yield curve control, YCC. Before we move on to the continent, and pardon me if you live on a continent other than a European one, but let's be honest, you just aren't culturally relevant. Let's play central bankers, say the darndest things. This is the BOE was this is what the BOA was spitting pre-meltdown. In Financial Times in October 2021. 
The governor of the Bank of England warned on Sunday that it will have to act to curb inflationary pressure, making no attempt to contradict financial market moves that have priced in the first interest rates increased before the end of the year. Speech govern, uh, from Governor Andrew Bailey on July 19, 2022. Let me be quite dear. Sorry. Let me be quite clear. There are no ifs or buts in our commitment to the 2% inflation target. That's our job, and that's what we'll do. The official monetary announcement, policy announcement at the MPC on August 4th of 2022. The MPC will take the actions necessary to return inflation to the 2% target sustainably in the medium term in line with its, with its remit. And this is what they say when their financial system almost blew up in one trading session. On September 28th, the Bank of England's Financial Policy Committee noted the risk to the UK financial stability from dysfunctional in the guild market. It recommended that action be taken and welcomed the bank's plan for temporary and targeted purchases in the guild market of financial on financial stability grounds at an urgent pace. Hmm. Apparently, it's dysfunctional when the price goes down, but functional when the price goes up. In that case, can I call my crypto portfolio dysfunctional and get a BOE bailout? Let's now move on to the EU and the ECB. The ECB is trying to fight the good fight against inflation, but it too will soon succumb to the YCC virus for many of the same reasons as the BOE. Back in Germany at the ECB tower in Sonmestrassen 20 in Frankfurt, economically speaking, the only two countries that matter in the EU are France and Germany. The entire goal of modern European history has been preventing Germany and Russia from joining forces. Let me read that again. The entire goal of modern European history has been preventing Germany and Russia from joining forces. The manufacturing prowess of Germans combined with cheap Russian commodities could be a game-changing force from a geopolitical point of view. The EU is an artifice, a political ploy of France to keep Germany down, which the Germans only went along with due to their guilt over World War II. The U.S. shares France's interests, and it too lurks in the shadows, standing ready to prevent any real alliance between Germany and Russia. A weak EU serves the political interests of America quite well. The Eurasia landmass must be prevented from unifying at all costs. I'm paraphrasing Daddy Felix quite a bit here, as I felt a direct quote of a substantial chunk of his most recent uh, missive would probably garner me a spanking. So, Daddy Felix is... Uh, somebody he listens to often in a report. As with everything else in life, unpacking the energy policy of Germany is the best, is the best means through which to understand why the German economy is fundamentally fucked, as well as why that spells doom for the broader EU. Germany, the EU's only real economic engine, is being rendered impotent due to a lack of affordable energy, and as a result, a depression looms. For the EU, amidst this economic malaise, the Union is at serious risk of splintering. In order for the ECB to keep up the EU intact, it will likely have to ditch any plans to shrink its balance sheet and quickly move to outright YCC in order to save the unholy political union that is the EU. France, to its credit, and I find very few geopolitical things to give France credit for, actually did the intelligent thing and went all in on nuclear energy. Roughly 70% of the electricity generation is nuclear powered. The source is the AIEA. Therefore, their manufacturing base can withstand the cessation of Russian gas flows. Germany, on the other hand, cannot. My boy Zoltan produced this excellent graph which details just how fucked Germany is as cheap Russian gas is removed from the industrial uh, econ economy. Essentially, 27 billion worth of Russian gas powers almost 2 trillion worth of German economic output, meaning they need that power to make things happen and build things and export things. An effective energy leverage of almost 75x. The German public were hoodwinked into believing the same energy fairy tales their politicians bought into, and as a result, they overwhelmingly allowed the Green Party to dismantle any efforts to build a functioning nuclear energy ecosystem over the past several decades. So, unlike France, 
The sabotage of the Nord Stream 1 and 2 pipelines have left Germany with quite literally no option but to import expensive American and Qatari liquid natural gas via supertankers. The mainstream media touts the limitless ability of the Americans to send cheap gas to Europe, but the gas is only cheap because America is not the swing producer for the Western world. Should that come to be, which would cause gas prices to rise domestically in America, the plebs would agitate for the cessation of imports so that they would pay more to heat their homes. In this scenario, German goods would carry a significantly higher price if they could be produced at all. We can already see the impact of rising producer prices in Germany, which have surged 46% year on year, according to the August reading. As a result, the German current account is quickly hurtling towards zero and will enter negative territory shortly thereafter. This chart is the German producer price index year to, year to change. And look at that, just way, way up, 45 points. And this is the German account going up, up, up for a long time and then just dropping. The reason this matters is a curious contradiction called target two. Let's hear it from the horse's mouth what exactly this beat is. Target two is the real-time growth settlement RTGS system owned and operated by the Euro system. Central banks and commercial banks can submit payment orders in Euro to Target 2, where they are possessed, sorry, where they are processed and settled in central bank money, i.e. money held in an account with the central bank. This source is directly from the European Central Bank. In case you are not steeped in economic dogma, let me attempt to explain this in my vernacular. Above is a chart of intra-EU credits and debits between members, different countries. So over to the far left, you have Germany, DE. Over to the far right, you have Italy, okay? And all the countries in between, Greece, yada, 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 all of them, right? This is target two. Because Germany is the powerhouse of Europe, it runs trade surpluses with the rest of the members, and it is owed money And with the rest of its members, it's owed money. So Italy would own, owe Germany the most based off of this chart. Think of Greeks buying G-Wagons with IOUs. And as a side note, I recently saw the G-Wagon pickup truck in real life and it's fucking badass. Yeah, go watch a video about this. If each country in the EU had their own fiat currencies, then the above chart would tell you that the douche mark would be stronger than the Italian Lira. It also tells you that if the rest of the if Europe had to buy goods from countries outside the EU, the euro would be a much weaker currency. And essentially, what this is showing you, Target 2 is basically a place, it's like a single exchange amongst all the currencies of Europe and instead give all the people the, the euro, okay? So it's like... Germany gets to print a lot more of the euros than Italy does, for instance. If each country in the EU had their own fiat currencies, and the above chart would tell you that, okay, we said this. It also tells you, uh, okay, it also tells you that if the rest of Europe had to buy goods from countries outside the EU, the euro would be a much weaker currency. In other federal versus provincial state polit political setups, the imbalances are smoothed out by credits and debits between the smaller political units. This is possible because those systems are typically both a financial and fiscal union. But the EU is purely financial, and thus the center cannot force the periphery to settle the imbalances between themselves. To date, Greeks have never needed to buy Fords or Kias instead of BMWs. But what if Germany had to shut down its auto manufacturing plants due to a lack of energy? Italians have, uh, sorry, Italians have gotten along just fine buying ammonia from Germany rather than China. But what if BASF had to shut down its Ludwigsfund facility due to a lack of affordable natural gas? I, su I suspect you're starting to see the problem here. <clears throat> All those debits that EU countries typically owe to Germany would suddenly be owed to foreign producers like America, China, South Korea, Japan, etc. instead. And since these countries aren't tied to an uneconomic union for the sake of politics, they will demand hard fiat currency like USD rather than 
toilet paper, or I guess toilet plastic, that the Euros have now become. For a politician schooled in Keynesian economics, when you can't afford the market price of a good, there's a very simple solution. As the government, you can issue debt and force production to continue. The debt is used to cover the cost differential between what a business can afford and the international market price being price of energy. Germans, due to their institutional memory of Weimar Republic's hyperinflation, are very conservative when it comes to monetary policy. The only thing holding back even more proliferacy, proligacy, pro, sorry, <laughs> profligacy at the ECB is the Bundesbank, but without cheap energy, Germany will have to attempt to print their way out of their problems. And just like every other nation, they will issue more bonds to cover fiscal transfers. With a great supply of buns, buns are bonds in the German term, the price will decline. That's a problem for the entire EU because without, Germany monetar without German monetary discipline, the euro would long ago have become a trash currency akin to any other emerging market that imports energy and food and whose labor and unco is uncompetitive in the global market. All other EU country bonds are priced relative to buns. In fact, the ECB's money printing operation is specifically geared towards keeping the spread of the weak EU members' bond, bonds versus buns at reasonable levels. If buns go down, everyone, everyone goes down. Similar to the UK, it will likely be the German politicians seeking re-election who precipitate a sell-off in buns. They will promise goodies for industry and individuals in order to alleviate the economic impact of the lack of cheap Russian gas and bonds invest and bond investors will understandably not have none of that. Just like the, in the UK long-term guilds market, the long dated bonds will get smoked. As bonds yield skyrocket, the ECB will face a raft of uber levered financial players who will instantly go insolvent should they market, mark to market their fixed income derivative books at the higher bond yields. An example of some goodies for the people, Germany has pledged to spend 200 billion euros to help consumers and businesses cope with energy prices, including promoting renewable energy production. And that, ladies and germs, is how and why the ECB will immediately abandon QT, quantitative tightening, move to a stopgap QE program to normalize the bond and every other EU bond market, and eventually graduate to yield curve control as the market pukes bonds of all stripes into the loving hands of Christine Lagarde. I bet she has soft hands too. As the German, econo as the German economy self implodes, the 30 year bun market has already begun to take notice. Look at the meteor meteoric rise in yields that started in 2021. The current 30 year bun yield, just on the rise from basically zero, almost up to 2%. Let's play the ECB says the darndest things. We took today's decision and expect to raise interest rates further because inflation remains too far too high and is likely to stay above our target for an extended period. Christine Lagarde. The governing council stands ready to adjust all of its instruments within its mandate to ensure that inflation stabilizes as 2% target over the medium term. High inflation is a major challenge for all of, all of us. The Governing Council will make sure that inflation returns to our 2% target over the medium term. That's the before, and can't, I can't wait to read about the after. I imagine that, similar to the Bank of England, the ECB will cite market dysfunction in the debt market and as their reason for ditching their plans to shrink their balance sheet so quickly and resuming QE once more. 80%. I like my YCC just like I like my dark chocolate. 80% and above, once you go black, you never go back. With 80% of the world's major central banks either conducting QE and or on their way to outright YCC, it is enough to overcome the toughness of Sir Powell with respect to the price of the fungible risky assets. Is it enough to overcome the toughness of Sir Powell? That's the question. Gold and crypto are fungible global risky assets. A bar of gold is a bar of gold 
wherever, whether you're in New York, London, Frankfurt, Tokyo, Shanghai, and the same goes for a Satoshi. As more euros, yen, renminbi, and pounds are printed, at some point people will start moving their savings from these currencies into either dollars or their stores of value. That means that the USD will continue to strengthen as long as the Fed continues raising rates and shrinking its balance sheet. But gold to euro and BTC to Jap Japanese yen could also catch a strong bid. Given the gold and crypto markets are much smaller in size than the trillions in fiat money that will be printed, in non-USD currency terms, these assets will appreciate. Now, because we care about the global price or the USD price from a trading perspective, these flows only matter in one specific instance. If the BTC Euro price appreciates faster than the Euro USD declines, then an arbitrage exists. Here's how it works. First, a USD-based investor notices the high price of BTC in the terms of Euros. This investor borrows USD then sells it versus buying BTC. Then, so he sells it to go buy BTC, meaning he buys BTC with it. Then he sells the BTC to, and trades it for euros. Then he trades the euros back in USD. The investor pays back the USD loan and the remainder is their profit. This triangular F, uh, FX arbitrate will push the global USD price of BTC in line with the elevated price of BTC in euros the Japanese yen, Chinese yuan, and the Great Britain pound. As the non-Fed central bank gets get, sorry, as the non-Fed central banks get real serious about the task of printing money, even if the Fed continues QT, which I don't believe they will be able to do it for much longer than early 2023, a small size stores of value like gold and Bitcoin could r still rise. Arthur. This is just more copium, you might retort. And to that, I say patience. This process will not be immediate. The economic and political forcing functions I discussed won't happen overnight, but it's clear from the BOE example that once the politicians set in motion the policies necessary to placate the, their electorate, the bond markets will have none of it. This is no immediate solution to decades worth of poor energy policy decisions. Therefore, money printing will be the only political expedient option, expedient option. Once bond markets see what is coming with more and more stimulative budgets, yield will rise and the over leveraged fiat debt based financial system will quickly buckle, followed by the equally rapid appearance of monetary bailout. America is a self-sufficient in food America is self-sufficient in food, fuel, and people. China, Europe, Japan, and the UK are not so blessed. America can be an autarchy if it pleases. As a result, the Fed has the luxury of being able to prioritize domestic political concerns regarding inflation over and above supplying the world and most of its allies. With a constant flow of, of dollars, a constant flow of dollars allows, sorry, bup, bup, bup. As a result, the Fed has the luxury of being able to prioritize domestic political concerns regarding inflation over and above supplying the world with a constant flow of dollars. And a constant flow of dollars allows the rest of the world to print their currencies and still afford to buy energy in USD terms. It's a relative game. And if the strongest player, player goes their own way, everyone else is left to suffer. I'm working on creating a GDP weighted index that charts the amount of money printed by these five central banks. I will share it and its rate of change when it's ready. This will then give us a way to visually track the point at which the monetary, the money printing of the 80% eclipses the tightening of the Fed. Wow. Arthur, you are hilarious when you're writing these things. It's so funny <laughs> listening. But hey, let me know what you think. This is one of the most interesting topics when it comes to all this right now that it's all about energy and this political like setup of 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 hoodwinking germany over years and years because of the worry of them ever gaining alliance with russia let me know what you think down in the comments again 
subscribe down below if you have not already and uh, turn on the post notifications so you know that when the next video is coming up, like, share, comment, and I'll see you on the next one. Peace.